This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The first games of the 2023 men's college basketball tournament got underway last night with the first four, which means it is time to dive in to the opening round on Thursday. We're going to break down every region in action with Austin Cass, get his read on those games where he has seen value to get you ready for what should be a fantastic day in sports. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Com. Joined here, as mentioned by Austin Cast. Check him out on Twitter at Austin Cast. You can find his work over at numberfire.com. Austin, happy tourney time to you. How are you doing today? Uh, doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I have to ask you, though, for personal reasons. Um, I'm filling my bracket and I kind of like watching basketball this year. It was hard to get super enthused about Indiana at times. But there were also times where they looked really good. You're an IU fan. How do you feel about Indiana from a bracket perspective? Not betting perspective, bracket perspective. Can I feel okay having them win more than one game? You can, yes. Uh, <laughs> that was not the most confident answer I've ever heard. <laughs> well, I'll say this. I I really wanted them as an IU fan to get a four seed. I always feel like yeah. there's a huge difference in being a four or a five when it comes to that first round game. Mm -hmm. And they did. And I think they were fortunate to get that. Mm -hmm. And the five seed in their little pod, Miami, I think might be the worst five seed. So I think the draw was kind to them, but I don't know. I've seen IU play really, really well this year, and I've seen IU be very beatable a lot of the time. So I don't know, but I think you could say that for so many of the four, five, six seeds, that could be just chaos this year. I mean, honestly, like there are three seeds you could say that for. It's a weird year for sure. Um, yeah. But I just, I don't know. Um, that region specifically is giving me fits. So. Hopefully they do something. I'm not super high in the Big Ten. In fact, I'm pretty low on them across the board, um, but they might be the one exception. So I'm glad to hear you're not totally, totally out. Obviously not the most confident answer, which gives me a little bit of pause, but um, we'll see how that plays out. What we're going to do for today with Austin is break down all the Thursday games in the men's college basketball tournament. Uh, we'll go through where Austin's seen value in each region and get you ready there from a spread and money line total perspective. Later on, I'll go through some NASCAR stuff for Atlanta too. We'll dump that at the end uh, in case you're trying to bet that. In addition, the NCAA tournament. If you want to talk some Friday games, we're back later on today with Ben Steve Stevens of Sports Grid. He'll talk about the Friday games, outline where he has seen value there. Going region by region, we'll also talk some futures with both Ben and Austin as well. If you want to get our bracket breakdown show, search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We had Dr. Ed Feng and Bennett Corcoran with us on Monday, breaking down strategy, breaking down each region, breaking down national champions, all that in the same place. You can find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, but also on the FanDuel YouTube page. So just search for that wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe, check it out, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. We'll dive in to the Thursday games here in just one second, but this March, take a shot at College Hoops with a no-sweat bet on FanDuel Sportsbook. It doesn't matter if you're new to FanDuel or already have an account. Right now, all customers can tip off the tourney with a no-sweat bet. Just sign into your FanDuel Sportsbook account to claim yours today. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point spreads, that 5v12 seed matchup you've been eyeing. All on that that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. There's no better place to bet the tournament than FanDuel Sportsbook. Just sign into your FanDuel Sportsbook account to claim your no-sweat bet today. Make every moment more at FanDuel. Must be 21-plus and present in select states. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max bonus bet $5 unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hope is here. Gambling help 
line ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with the Kansas Star Casino LLC. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in indiana 1-800-9 with it in wyoming and kansas 1-800-522-4700 or in kansas ksgamblinghelp.com louisiana 1-877-770-STOP in maryland mdgamblinghelp.org in west virginia go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net now, Austin, we'll dive into the actual games here for Thursday in just one second. But first, I wanted to talk to you because we haven't talked futures yet on the show. We talked about the brackets. We're going to talk about individual games, but I'm not the biggest futures guy. So I wanted to pick your brain about any futures you like before tip off on Thursday. So when you look at the board at FanDuel Sportsbook, what stands out to you there right now? So it's funny how this worked out because you brought up Indiana. I didn't know you were going to do that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really zeroed in on the 14 pod of IU and Kent State and Drake and Miami. I think Miami and IU are both fairly vulnerable. So I'm eyeing Drake and Kent State Sweet 16 futures. Oh. Uh, Drake is plus 420 to make the Sweet 16, while Kent State is plus 520. Uh, by our nerd metric here at Numberfire, IU has a historical nerd of a seven seed. They've shown a high ceiling beating Purdue twice, including once at Mackey in what was probably their best game of the year. But I think they benefited greatly from a Big Ten that has just one top 20 squad on Ken Palm. IU barely shoots any threes. They rank 355th in three-point attempt rate, which is last among tourney teams. And they're just a four-and-a-half-point favorite, so odd makers aren't too high on them. It's a similar story for Miami. By nerd, they're comparable to a, a historical 11 seed. So, yeah, 11. They were – you, you kind of get that across the board. as a little bit of a down year in college basketball in general. Yeah. but. Uh, they were also aided by a down year from the conference. The ACC has just one team in the top 30 and none in the top 20 on Ken Palm. And the Hurricanes have them, had some close luck, uh, close game luck go their way. They went seven and four in games decided by five or fewer points. So taking Drake and Kent State to get to the Sweet 16 is my way of trying to take advantage of what I think are a weak four and five seed in IU and Miami. Yeah, so Drake, as you mentioned, plus 420 to make it uh, over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Kent State is plus 520. And honestly, like, how surprised would you be if we saw those two teams facing each other in the second round where you're kind of locked into, a, uh, a, you know, one of them advancing? Would that blow you away if that happened? No, it wouldn't. So when, when I started looking at this, I was actually going down the route of just Drake at plus 420. Yeah. And then I started thinking, man, it wouldn't really be that crazy at all if they played Kent State. You could just bet both of these, right. turn a profit no matter what. If those two play each other, obviously one of the bets has to be a loser, and they don't love doing that. But, right. um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we see Kent State and Drake play on uh, in the second round. Okay. Uh, if you find egg on your house, Austin, I, it, this is, you know, why now, at least, uh, betting against IU, you mentioned, you know, I mean, I know you're closer to Purdue, so maybe we'll talk about that at some point too. Uh, but like, you know, I'm just saying you did this to yourself. I did not encourage you to do this. You brought this on yourself. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you're right. Okay, well, let's go and talk about some individual games here and start things off again. We're talking about the Thursday games. Let's start things off here in the South region. Six games there. We got plenty of tight spreads. I uh, got Utah State, Mizzou pretty tight. West Virginia, Maryland. Any spreads, money lines, or totals you like when you look at the South region games specifically, Austin? So I'm really excited to watch that West Virginia, Maryland game, first game of the day. And I think it's a really strong 8-9 game, but... For betting value, I'm looking at Utah State's minus 120 money line price against Missouri. Um, this week, I wrote up a, a piece on four teams that can bust brackets. And honestly, for three of the teams, you're sort of, I was sort of pitching a dream that we all know is possible, but also very much a long shot. But yeah. it was very easy to make a case for Utah State. Advanced metrics just love them. Um, our model has them as the 16th best team in the country. Ken Palm has them 18th, and Bart Torvik has them 25th. Missouri, despite being the better seed in this game, is outside the top 50 by all three of those rating systems. Utah State is 14th in adjusted offense, 
and per Ken Palm, and they check pretty much every box you could want in an offense. They get up plenty of threes. They rank 50, 57th nationally in three-point attempt rate, and they are 69th in free throw attempt rate. So they take a lot of threes. They get to the line a lot, which is how you get to be the 14th ranked offense in the country. Um, they're also a respectable 64th in adjusted defense. They've lost eight games this year, but three of the eight losses were to a really good San Diego State team. And of those three losses, two were by a combined seven points. So I like Utah State to get past Missouri. And if that happens, I'd actually give them a fighting chance against Arizona, which is who they'd likely see in the second round. Yeah. Uh, so Utah State, again, the 10 seed. They are minus one and a half on the spread at minus 110, but Austin taking the money line here at minus 120. I just want to look quickly at the Sweet 16 odds uh, for Utah State, because you do like, as you mentioned, their path to potentially get there, uh, but it could be maybe you're betting the spread for them in the second round. Uh, they are plus 440 to advance to the Sweet 16. That's actually not terrible. I know they're facing the two seed in the second round, but relative to what we saw for Kent State and Drake, that's not terrible. I, I think you can probably do better, honestly, pairing the two money lines together, taking the Utah State money line in both games, but plus 440 at least consideration for them uh, when it comes to that. But again, Austin going the money line at minus 120 uh, for that first game. Anything yeah. else you like there in the South region, Austin? Uh, no, not, not nothing that I'm really seeing. Like I said, just as a fan, I'm excited for that West Virginia-Maryland game because I think yeah. both those teams are pretty good, but nothing betting-wise. Okay, well, let's shift over to the West now. Uh, the West, four games going on on Thursday, and three of the four games have spreads of less than three points, so a lot of potentially close games here. Any bets stand out to you in the West, Austin? This is my favorite region by far. I think the West is absolutely loaded, uh, easily the toughest region by our numbers here at number five. I'm super intrigued by the Northwestern and Boise State game. Um, I think it's a market versus metrics clash. Pretty much all the projection sites out there have Boise State as a slight favorite. Um, the line opened as such with Boise a slim favorite, which is what you'd expect. But the line, line quickly on Sunday night in a span of a couple hours flipped to Northwestern being a slim favorite. And that's where it still stands as Northwestern is minus 120 on the money line and a one and a half point favorite. Despite what the metrics say, and again, almost all of them have Boise State as the better team. I'm going to jump on board with the market and the line movement and take Northwestern at minus 120 in what should be a really close and fun game. Uh, I did not pay you to say this as I'm wearing my Northwestern hat uh, here on the stream. Um, and I thought that that was super interesting because right when it was announced who Northwestern was playing, I saw basically all, you know, Northwestern Twitter saying, oh boy, <laughs> you know, they were expecting Boise to be like a one to two point favorite to what they opened at, as you mentioned. So I was kind of shocked, honestly, that this line moved towards Northwestern because didn't enter on the best string um, struggle in the big 10 tournament. Their one game there it was only one game. They played Friday. They had a couple rough games towards the end of the regular season too, but they do have like higher profile wins. So how do you reconcile that for yourself? You know, when you're looking at a team that has some wins against Purdue, against Indiana, uh, but is Northwestern and also struggled a bit down the stretch, how do you kind of reconcile those two things, especially when the metrics favor Boise State in this game? Yeah, I I think it's just super interesting game. I'm really excited to see how it plays out because, yeah, I – normally would side with the metrics mm -hmm. and if the line had just stayed at one and a half minus one and a half for Boise State I I would have actually been interested in in betting Boise State to cover the spread but the line movement carries a lot of weight with me sure and those like obviously the books are intelligent they know that right. everyone's going to be checking Ken Palm Bartorovic right. etc and so they're basically when I look at this line I feel like Fandle Sportsbook is daring you <laughs> to bet on Boise State, right? Yeah. So usually in that situation, then I want to be on the other side. <clears throat> I want to be on the side that seems like maybe it doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. I still have not bet this game. Um, undecided if I will. Do I want to get the emotional hedge in there? Um, I can't bet Northwestern because I go strictly by the numbers in sports. I don't know. Uh, but we'll see if I get the emotional hedge in there or not before Thursday uh, in the West. Okay. Let's talk about the Midwest. Now it is uh, four games there as well. Spreads here, not quite as tight as they were in the West. When we talk about the Midwest, Austin, anything stand out to you there? 
I like the over in the Auburn Iowa eight nine game. The total set at one fifty one point five. I was a super over friendly team, which won't surprise anybody who's seen them play. Uh, the overs won out in eight of their past 12 games on Ken Palm, their third and adjusted offense, 167th in defense and 66th in adjusted tempo. So they play really fast or pretty fast. They're elite on offense and kind of stink on defense. Um, so yeah, obviously they're an over friendly team. Auburn's much more well-rounded, but the overs still cashed in four of their previous five games. Um, our model and Bart Torvik both have the over uh, being the side to be on. Bart Torvik is a lot more bullish than we are. They have the total at 156 points. Okay. So I'm not quite that bullish, but I do side with the over in that game. Yeah, that's the Auburn Iowa game, the 8 9 game. Uh, 151 and a half right now is the total for that game. As you mentioned, Iowa, plenty of offense there. Auburn, similar thing as well. Um, so that could be intriguing. And if both, Bartorovic and number fire leaning towards the over there. Think that we could see some fireworks for that game. So 151 and a half minus 110 on the over in that one. The lone region we have not yet discussed. Just a couple of games down the East Austin. So it's possible we're not seeing a whole lot here. Oral Roberts against Duke. We got uh, ULL against Tennessee. Looking at those two games, anything you like for uh, the East region? Yeah, I'm taking Oral Roberts to cover as a okay. six and a half point dog. Uh, Duke's obviously playing very well right now, probably the best they've played all season. But I think it's pretty easy to make a case for Duke being slightly overrated. Um, for one, the ACC was way better, as we referenced earlier with Miami. Uh, Duke's the only team in the Ken Palm top 33 from the ACC. Duke also went 7-2 and two in five-point games, so they caught some close game luck. Uh, or Roberts is 56th on Ken Palm and is led by their offense, which is – 23rd by Ken Palm's adjusted offense. They're 30 and four. <clears throat> Sorry, they're 30 and four and have lost just once since November 22nd. So they obviously know how to win games. If I'm going to knock Duke for being the ACC, I'm going to have to say something about Oral Roberts going undefeated in the what was a poor Summit League. But mm-hmm. uh, Oral Roberts actually played a very good non conference schedule. They played Houston, St. Mary's, Utah State, New Mexico, and Liberty. New Mexico and Liberty didn't make the dance, but are both top 60 squads on Bart Torvik, and Liberty just beat Villanova last night in the NIT. Um, Bart Torvik has a, or Roberts losing by 4.9 points, and our model feels even more strongly about the Golden Eagles. We have them losing by 2.6, so I'm on, on Oral Roberts to cover the 6.5 points. Yeah, six and a half minus 115 is the number there for Oral Roberts to cover against Duke, and it sounds like you're kind of going into this overall tournament under the assumption that the ACC this year is not what it was previously. And that's something that we talked about with Ed as well. He, we were talking about the ACC tournament last week. And I think I asked him, you know, any takeaways for you from the futures market? He said, I think the conference stinks. That was his first takeaway was that, you know, just overall not in on the ACC. And it sounds like for you, both with the Miami discussion and with this Duke discussion, it sounds like you're kind of going in with the assumption the ACC might be a bit overvalued in the markets. And I think that making assumptions like that and having bets that are correlated to that assumption, I think that pays off. And the Big Ten's been kind of the conference that's gotten most of the talk as far as like it sucks this year. But the ACC, I think, is in in that consideration set as well. It sounds And it sounds like that's where you're leaning as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think the ACC has definitely been worse than the Big Ten. And then yeah. both are obviously down from where we usually have them. You know, I've lived in Big Ten country my whole life and typically uh, probably am too biased when it comes to my brackets and bets and will overvalue the Big Ten. Yeah. This year, I'm pretty low on them, so I'm expecting to see at least two of them in the Final Four. Right. So, yeah, as long as one of them's IU, I'm totally fine with it. So Yeah. I I'm the same way where I have been too high in the big 10 to my detriment in the past, uh, not doing that this year, very few wins uh, for the big 10 in my bracket, but hopefully one of them is Northwestern. Hopefully we get IU uh, there as well. That is Austin cast. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Austin cast and find his work over at number fire. You mentioned a couple of articles he has written. Those are up over at number fire. So you can check those out to finalize your bracket. Austin, Uh, Good luck to IU. Good luck to you as well. And uh, looking forward to talking to you once again here in the very near future. Sounds good. Thank you. 
All righty. Again, Austin is on Twitter at Austin cast. We'll get him back on here on the show. Um, a couple a, a next week to talk about some uh, sweet uh, elite eight games. So that'll be a lot of fun. Get Austin back on the year then to break down. Those uh, should be a good time as always. Now, as mentioned, do you want to dive into some NASCAR here before we close up shop for today? Cause not going to have a whole lot of time to do that later on this week. The NASCAR cup series and the truck series and the Xfinity series all out in uh, Atlanta for this week. So I wanted to run through quickly what my numbers are saying and uh, didn't get a lot of time to prepare notes on this because the the non-outright markets just went up basically half an hour before we record, I believe. I hadn't seen them before then. So I want to run through what my numbers are saying here in Atlanta for the NASCAR Cup Series. And looking at the outrights, only a couple spots where I'm seeing value. Those two spots are Bubba Wallace at 20 to 1, Eric Jones at 30 to 1. You can find Jones 35 at the William Hill shop. So shop around if you want to bet Eric Jones. Do that. Bubba Wallace 20 to 1. You can also get 22 on him, I believe, at MGM right now. So shop around on both those guys. But I would say if we're talking FanDuel specifically, both of them have very good podium odds. Bubba Wallace in the podium market, plus 650. Eric Jones, I believe, is 11 to 1. Yes, he is 11 to 1. I think both those numbers might be a tiny bit better than the outrights. Uh, I've got Wallace at 14.9% to podium, and I've got Eric Jones at 14.4%. The reason that I have both those guys there is twofold. First thing is they're on... Teams that are fast enough on the mile and a half. So I know Eric Jones in Las Vegas was not like phenomenal by any means, but he wasn't pitiful either. Uh, in that race, Eric Jones in Las Vegas, 15th place average running position in Fontana. He was 16th. He kind of struggled to work his way through the pack in Fontana, starting all the way in the back. So I think that made sense. And the speed for legacy doesn't seem as good as it was last year. But it's also, again, not prohibitively bad where we should ignore him on a track where drafting is heavily involved. So that's why I like Jones. As for Wallace, he had good speed in Vegas. Uh, he finished in the top five there, had an eighth place average running position. So good speed on the mile and a half. And we know Wallace is one of the better pack racers in all of NASCAR. So he's plus 650 to podium. Jones is 11 to one. I like both those numbers. So if you're betting FanDuel specifically, I'd probably lean towards those two podium markets versus the outrights on those two guys. If you can get Jones 35 to one to win, I'd probably take that. Uh, Wallace 22 would probably lean a bit towards that over the outright as well uh, versus the 20 to one market at FanDuel. So I think those are the two guys as far as outrights or podium odds where I'm seeing value. As far as top tens go, I do have Eric Jones uh, showing value there as well. So not surprisingly, back all in on Eric Jones once again this week. Eric Jones finished top 10 at FanDuel, is plus 250. I have him at 41.3% to finish inside the top 10. That's actually a pretty high number, um, so maybe it's a bit too high, but 41% for me versus 29% at plus 250, I think that gap is pretty large. So I can be off on Eric Jones and still show value. And I want to take that. So what I would do with Eric Jones, kind of layer things, uh, put a bit on the top 10 market, put a little bit less on the podium market. So you can profit if he finishes inside the top 10, but then have a really good day. Should he podium win, et cetera, et cetera. I think that he is a good layering candidate in that regards. So Eric Jones, uh, plus 250, first top 10 bet I want to turn towards. The next one that I have showing value is a bit lower on the board. That's Austin Dillon. I'm not really sure why, but Austin Dillon's plus 360 to finish inside the top 10 at FanDuel Sportsbook. We saw the speed from the RCR cars at Daytona. He and Kyle Busch started the final restart or second to last restart on the front row together. And Dillon was a legit threat to win that race. He won in Daytona uh, last year. He's a two-time Daytona winner. And... I think that RCR will have enough speed on this track type to be very good. So I have Dylan at 25.3% uh, to finish inside the top 10. His implied odds, 21.7% at plus 360. Big enough gap for me. So good enough speed, very good pack racer. Dylan checks enough boxes where I'm fine going there. Looking briefly at other spots where I'm showing value right now uh, in the top 10 market, I do show value on Ty Gibbs. Uh, he's six to one to finish inside the top 10. I think it's fair to be skeptical of the talent on Gibbs, not in terms of overall talent. He's very talented, but can he be a good pack racer in the cup series immediately? I don't know, but 
Atlanta is going to be more of a speed centric track than Daytona was. And we saw Gibbs win the uh, Xfinity series race in this track last year. He, they went to overtime and ran a bit late and he said that he missed a date uh, because uh, of the race going long, but Hey, he won the race. So probably a fair trade off for him. Gibbs at six to one, I think is very intriguing. I've got him at 22.5%. I've been a little bit too high on Gibbs so far this year versus the market. His implied odds though, 14.3%. So similar to Jones, a lot of wiggle room to be off on him and still show value. So I think that's fine and I'm okay going there. So Ty Gibbs, six to one, finish inside the top 10. I do like that. I have not decided whether to bet these other ones. I do want to list other spots where I'm showing value right now, though, just in case. So Jones, a big one, then Dylan, then Gibbs. Other spots where I see a bit of value, Justin Haley, plus 340. Very good pack racer. I have a group bet on him, and I have a group bet on him in the Xfinity Series race this week as well. Not a ton of value, 25.1% for me versus 22.7% implied. It's pretty small gap. Ryan Priest plus 480. I have a 21.2% versus 17.2% implied. Decent gap. Not sure if I'll get there, but it is a decent gap. Michael McDowell has not had good speed on the mile and a half uh, or the non drafting tracks this year. A bit worrisome. I have an 18% to finish top 10 versus 16.7% implied. Might go there. Uh, I've got speed or some value on Josh Berry at five to one. Not a big fan of him in terms of his drafting skill, but again, Hendrick cars will be fast this weekend. That does matter more in Atlanta than it does in Daytona. And then other one that I see here is Corey LaJoy, who almost won Atlanta last year. I have met 20% to finish top 10 versus 16.7% implied. And then Harrison Burton too at plus 650. So a lot of guys in the, the six to the, the three to six range in terms of finishing top 10, I'm seeing value on. I think if I had to guess right now, I will take Jones. I will take Dylan. I will likely take Gibbs. If I had to pick someone else, I'm probably going to go towards, honestly, I would lean towards McDowell at five to one, just because I trust the pack racing acumen. He won at Daytona a couple years ago. The, the speed is okay enough for me to be there. So I would say likely McDowell, the fourth guy I would go towards. So I check out the podium odds uh, for Eric Jones, check out the podium odds for Bubba Wallace, but then also top 10 odds for Eric Jones, plus 250, Ty Gibbs, six to one, Austin Dillon, plus 360, and then likely McDowell, five to one, other spot I am turning towards for this week in Atlanta. That is all that we have here for today on the show, though. Want to give a big thank you to Austin Cass for swinging by, breaking down his thoughts on these Thursday games. Find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. Find his work at numberfire.com. A reminder, we are back again later on today. We'll talk to Ben Stevens of Sports Grid, Big Ten Ben, to get his read on the Friday games across the NCAA men's tournament. Let you know where he is seeing value there. To get that as it is posted, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Also, check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page where these shows go up each and every weekday. No show tomorrow, uh, Thursday, because of the two for today. Then back on Friday, talk NFL free agency with Ryan Williams. We'll talk to you all once again in the very near future. Should be a fun couple of days in sports. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 